this afternoon, uh, what I want to talk about is a concept you're probably familiar with. I don't know if you're necessarily familiar with these terms or not, but it's cessationism versus continuationism. I think I'm saying those right. And so the one on the one hand, you've got cessationism, which is saying that all the gifts, sign gifts, prophecies, stuff like that, uh, that the charismatics uh, claim still go on. Uh, those things have actually stopped according to this view, which is what I believe. And then, uh, and then continuationism is the belief that they continue to go on. Thank you. And, uh, and so I was thinking about this and, you know, I, I don't think I've ever done a message where I really just kind of lay it out and try to give, give a good reason as to how we can know from the Bible and just even a little bit of just reasoning why those things don't continue. And I've always said that I don't believe that they're going on anymore, and I don't think there's a reason for them and everything, but never actually preached a message on that. And part of the problem is, you know, and I addressed this a little bit this morning, but there's a, always an admixture of truth to every lie. Every false doctrine out there, there's a little bit of truth. And so it's hard for me to, like, take a stand about, uh, against somebody that says, hey, you know, the Holy Spirit wants to allow us to do great, miraculous things. When God is a God of miracles... He can do great things. He, you know, why would we pray for somebody to get healed if he, didn't actu if he w couldn't actually heal them in this present day? And so I obviously believe uh, all that happens, but to actually be able to explain uh, just a little thought about why we, we can assume and, and, and be assured, I mean, I would say we can be dogmatically sure, actually, that this type of sign miracle, speaking in tongues, which, you know, I don't know how much I'll explain this to, uh, in this message, but speaking in tongues, I don't believe means anything like they think it means anyway. I think it's just a, a, a actual languages that people could understand in their native tongue. But, uh, but this uh, sign miracles of, I got this special revelation from God in a vision or in a dream. And if you deny that, they just, well, blasphemy of the Holy Ghost or something like that. Like, you, you know, you can't challenge them on that. They had a vision between God, right? Well, I don't believe that they, they did, you know. There's several possibilities. I think could be a demon. Sometimes people actually see visions. Sometimes somebody actually could be influenced by demonic power, I think. Uh, it could be that they're lying, and that's what I addressed this morning, and trying to take advantage of people for filthy lucre's sake or to, to deceive for one reason or another, uh, that, they're, that they're pretending that they're doing these things and they're really not. Or it could be the fact that we, kinda, we tend to believe what we want to believe. And if we're really looking for something to happen, we can kind of generate some, something happening. I shared this morning about how when I was a little kid, uh, we watched Ghostbusters. I don't know if you've ever seen it. I'm not recommending it. <laughs> but I watched Ghostbusters when I was a little kid. And so I gathered up all my friends and said, hey, let's go find some ghosts. <laughs> I knew in my head, right, there's no, there's no ghost. But let's go find some ghosts. So we started going into, like, you know, trying to find these run-down places, uh, abandoned buildings and stuff like that. And, and we, were, we were trying to find some ghosts. And, and I, at that time, I would have told people, we saw ghosts. You know, and I, and I was thinking about, like, the time a, a, a lid fell off of a trash can, and I'm pretty sure it was a cat knocked it over or something like that. But in our head, you know, we're, like, running because we're like, oh, there really is ghosts. <laughs> right? The thing is, when you're looking for something, you start making it happen. You know, if you're really looking for, if you're really wanting, and, and here's the funny thing about, you know, sometimes as a pastor, people will come, and they're trying to find out what the will of God is for their life. And really, they've already got it in their heart and in their mind what they want the will of God to be. And so they're not really listening for you to give them a good answer. They're just trying to get a confirmation that what they want to do, you're going to say, you're going to say that's it. And if you don't say, then they're going to find, well, let me go ask somebody else or something because people believe what they want to believe. And they uh, want it to be true, and so they'll make it true. I think sometimes people really feel like, I started speaking in tongues, or I, I really got healed, you know. Uh, they always explain like this, this, whenever there's a healing of some sort, like there's this fire that they feel inside of them or something like that. Could that be something that they just assume is going to be there because they've heard people tell the story before so they do it? Or, or could that, I, who knows what could be going on? And like I said, I, I hesitate to get onto it sometimes because I'm like, I believe God heals people, right? But I want to show you some reasons that we can uh, say 
pretty with pretty calm assurance. Like we're not we're not messed up because we're not seeing these sign miracles. You know, you know, we had a guy part of this movement. You guys all know who he was, but there was a guy who started just kind of uh, uh, turning on us and calling us heretics because we didn't believe that after a person's saved they see some kind of miracle. And he was, uh, long story short, he was describing it as a wind because John three eight talks about a wind coming down and. And he was saying like something happened to him whenever he got saved. And so every time we would say anything online about preaching the gospel, he would say, well, you didn't say anything about being born again. And when you're born again, you have these miracles. Very much, whether he would admit it or not, very much a charismatic influence. And what he believes is that has to happen for you to to really know and have assurance that you got saved. Well, that's not faith, right? Right. (laughs) The Bible says this. More blessed to uh, more blessed f- to those who who believe and have not seen, right? When it is what he told Thomas, and so uh, so really, I mean, even if that was a case, this person got saved and didn't have anything experience, any kind of experience. This person got saved. Let's say he did have an experience. I believe this person would have a stronger faith than that person because he didn't need a sign to be able to to prove that. But you can't just use that type of reasoning. We want to know what the Bible says and and give a better answer than that. But uh, but so I'm going to show you four things, really four points that I think will help us understand cessation, cessationism. Okay, number one is this. The first thing we have to do is consider the purpose of whether it's prophecies or healings or all the stuff we see in the Bible. What is the purpose of those sign miracles? Okay, and uh, by the way. Miracles in the Bible, contrary to what many may think, were very, very rare. People act like that's just a common thing, like every day miracles were happening all throughout the Bible or something like that. And that's actually not the way it happens at all. In fact, if you look it up, these are very loose figures. Forgive me, I know it won't be super accurate. But if you look up the time from Adam to Moses, you're talking like 2,000 years. And you know what? You won't find any miracles in that, <laughs> in that time. But God decides, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work in a supernatural way to confirm in the people's eyes that Moses is my prophet. And what he says was actually my words coming to pass. And so he begins to do some miracles with Moses. And only for about 50 or 60 years do you see Moses and then Joshua actually performing these miracles and, and having these uh, prophecies and stuff like that. Again, those numbers are loose, but I'm just saying if you really think about that, there aren't really that many miracles going on. Now, they're huge miracles, parting of the Red Sea, you know, turning the water into blood, all these things. Those are huge, which, by the way, those aren't really the kind of miracles you see today whenever people say, claim that they saw some great miracle, like, where's the proof? I mean, give me a picture with today's modern technology. Give me the proof that some of these things happen, right? But uh, I'll get to that here in a little bit. Turn to Judges chapter 6, if you would. Judges chapter 6. Now we're entering the time of the judges. And in verse 13 he says, And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befalling us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up out of, uh, up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. I just feel like there would have been a lot more for him to say if miracles were just happening all the time rather than going back to Moses and saying, What about all, this? all these miracles our fathers told us about? You know, Where are those miracles? You can tell it wasn't happening all the time, right? So here's a long period of time that goes on without any miracles. Uh, and then really from like Elijah up until Jesus comes, you don't really see miracles. Uh, you know, in fact, if you remember the story about John the Baptist uh, being, being born and, and his, his father, Zacharias, he, he, he has this vision and it's like he doesn't believe it. Like it's just... They've been waiting for this vision for all this time. God's been silent, quote unquote. He wasn't silent because he had the, you know, the word was still there. They were, they were aware of it, but they hadn't, they didn't see these signs, these open visions and all that. And so they're waiting and, and the, this happens and it's just, it's a miracle. Jesus, about 30 years old, we see him start performing miracles. We don't really know what he did before that, right? I think one of the Apocrypha books, I'm not sure which, says that he did some miracles as a kid, but I don't believe the, any of those. <laughs> if you ever read them, they just sound pretty, pretty crazy. 
But so he, uh, uh, so Jesus, about 30 years old, starts doing miracles. These miracles are signs, so people will say, "Hey, look what look what's going on. This is this is my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased." And he's and he's showing the people, you need to listen to him, okay? And uh, and and let's be honest. Only those who were going to believe Jesus even accepted his miracles. I mean, how many of the people still denied Jesus even though they saw the miracles? I think, oh, he must be deceiving us or something like that. Yeah. So <laughs> the sign miracles were just for those people that already wanted to believe, but it was just like, oh, okay, now I, now I get it. Does that make sense what I'm saying? So, so it's not like it was just this random thing where everybody had to do that so that everybody would be saved and they needed the confirmation to be saved. And in fact, Jesus made it very clear. Uh, even the, Samarit the uh, Samaritans that followed him, he said, they believe me because, I, because of my words, not because they just want bread and they saw the miracle and all that kind of stuff. And so, so obviously, uh, even though miracles are going on, that wasn't really the main thing that, that Jesus was trying to show everybody. <clears throat> so then for about, again, 50, 60 years, Jesus passes on uh, the ability uh, to, to have those powers through the Holy Spirit, and he passes them on to his apostles. And you get to, uh, uh, to uh, Paul, and Paul says, you know, he's the last apostle. And uh, surely he had passed on the gift of the Holy Spirit for some people to be able to do that. Uh, but for the most part, you know, we don't see that after Paul. We don't really see, see that. Okay, look at... Uh, uh, let's see here. Well, I already talked about how their lack of faith. If you looked at uh, uh, numbers, you would see that the people weren't believing, even though they were seeing the miracles. Matthew 12. Let's go there. Matthew 12. Matthew 12, verse 39. But he answered and said unto them, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. You know, really, that's the only sign we need is that Jesus rose from the dead. Oh, where's the proof of that? We receive it by faith. Amen. <laughs> right? So I don't have to see him raised from the dead. We just believe the record that... Uh, that we already have. So anyway, when you when you just think about why the miracles have to be there, you would say, okay, why would God be all of a sudden speaking through certain prophets? You know, they call it the apostolic. You know, a lot of them call it the apostolic faith, or so, and they think actually that they've brought they've come back to like an Acts two period, and now all of a sudden God showed up. If you trace it back to the Azusa Street Revival, where the, Pen where the charismatic movement really kind of began, it was just this thought like, oh great, man, God's showing up, he's giving us a sign. So that kind of even shows that they understood, like this was like a rare thing, not everybody was doing that. And so they think, oh, God's showing up. So why would he be showing up to speak to them, right? What would be the significance? What's God trying to show them? Well, some of them say, and I didn't really realize this until uh, Brother Justin and I were talking, and then I think you brought it up with one of the guys uh, that we interviewed about prophecy and what was the purpose of the prophecy, and they said something about forerunners. And he said, well, John the Baptist was a fore forerunner of Jesus. And so I think if you follow that out, what they're saying is they are forerunners of Jesus coming. And so what they're saying in essence is, the reason God is showing up with all these miracles and signs and for this generation is because we're ushering in Christ's coming. Right. We're a forerunner of Jesus Christ's coming. So again, it's not like all throughout time people did miracles, and so we naturally should be able to do miracles too. What they're saying is that something special is happening, and God gave us the ability to do miracles and see all these signs because he's trying to speak to us. Well, I think probably... If you really follow it out, God's not speaking to most of these guys. <laughs> All right. But something was different after the apostles, okay? And we read this with the end of John's uh, writings in, in Revelation 22. Something that ends after John seems very significant. Revelation 22. And 
and look at verse 16. I, Jesus, have set mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of this prophecy of this book, If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the prophecy of this prophecy, I mean, or the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. And so John is, is given this revelation, he's given this writings from Jesus, and it's saying that, look, you've, I've now given you these prophecies about some things that are about to happen. And in essence, now he's saying we have from the very first book of the Bible, Genesis, the creation of the world, unto this prophecy that's given about what's going to happen in the end time. And, he's, and it's like he's saying, look, this is now uh, immortalized into this canon of Scripture. Okay, And I realize there's some things that happen and where people divided them in different ways or whatever. But the fact is, everything was given to mankind. It was revealed through all the apostles and the prophets, and it's all done. Amen. It's been given. So now we, by faith, look at what they, these, these miracles that they say happened when they wrote that down, say these things happened. And we're by faith saying, wow, those are some amazing things that God did. Now someone who wants to reject the Bible is going to say, you know, here, here's an interesting thought. You know, we're talking about evolutionists and atheists and all that kind of stuff uh, uh, with, the, with the interview yesterday. And one thing that I find is really interesting is most, there is a lot of history in facts that are in the books, science books, all this kind of, or, or history books, whatever, archaeology, facts that the only way anybody knows these things happen is through the Bible. And as a whole, science says, well, yeah, sure. I mean, this is how we even know what happened during this civilization. This is what we have. The only way they know is by the records that are written in the Bible and say, this is our, this is our you know, authority that we're looking at that. Right. And so that's why when you watch a show, anybody ever watched a show where they try to explain how certain miracles might have happened? Like, like, well, the parting of the Red Sea is actually based probably off of just some stories that were told. And really, they just walked across the sea. It didn't really part like the Bible says, right? But just there was some random wind that just kind of dried it up a little bit. And, they were able to, and they'll say the most ridiculous things. You ever watched one of those? And you're like, what is this guy talking about? Right? But what they're trying to say is it's evident that something really happened and that they recorded this down and they believe this happened. Uh, it, it's evident that there was some kind of flood, like somebody in some region might have had a little bit of a flood. And so they wrote these things down. But they're, so they're not denying the Bible necessarily. But what they are denying is the, the miracles in the Bible, the supernatural that's in the Bible. Well, I read the supernatural things that are in the Bible, and I say, well, those, those happen too. Amen. If I can believe Genesis 1-1, that God created everything by the words of his mouth, I can believe that he uh, was able to work within the laws of nature that he created <laughs> and break those rules every once in a while as well. And so I just believe that. I don't have a problem believing that. Uh, but, but they have a problem believing that, and so they won't, they won't accept that. But the fact of the matter is, that's what faith's all about. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. So why would he just constantly be revealing new things? All those things happen so that we wouldn't have the record. We would say, I believe that by faith. And so, uh, so it's very interesting. If you just stop and think about what the miracles are, are, were for, what the signs were for, and what points of history they were actually used. Okay, number two is this. Here's another reason uh, to understand cessation, cessationism, and that is this, the lack of final instructions to those who would carry out the work of the ministry. And here's what I mean by that. Paul, for instance, knew that when he was gone, Titus was going to continue on the work. He's going to ordain elders. They're going to you know, continue on the work that he, he began. Timothy, same thing. You're going to carry on this work. And he's saying, you know, you've got to be strong and you've got to carry on and do all these kinds of things. What you don't find is him saying, now, you know, you're just going to do lots of miracles and heal people and, <laughs> and do all that. In fact, let's go ahead and go there real quickly. Now, you know what, before we go there, let's go to Mark. I want to address this first. So, he, so it is true. And this is what a lot of people that, that believe in uh, uh, continuationism 
This is what a lot of them will go to, the book of Mark. Mark chapter 16. We oftentimes will quote uh, the Great Commission, and we'll quote it from Matthew. And I think probably some people do that because they're kind of, a, kind of scared of what Mark says. <laughs> All right. But Mark chapter 16, look at verse 15. It says this, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world... And preach the gospel to every creature. Now, we like to stop there and say, see, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to preach the gospel. But here's what the Charismatics will often bring up. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Actually, there are other denominations that bring that part up. But he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. Now, the cool thing is, after you read through the gospel accounts, you read a book called Acts. The Acts of the Apostles. And you see what happens, you know, after the Holy Ghost, you know, actually does come upon them like we see in Acts 2. Yeah. And did we see anybody casting out devils in the book of Acts? Yeah, we yeah. see people casting out devils. And they shall speak with new tongues. Did we see anybody following up this spreading of the gospel and people getting saved? Did we see anybody speaking tongues? Well, sure we did. Acts 2. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. I don't know about the drinking the deadly thing, but we do know Paul got bit by a serpent, and, uh, and, and they said everybody, all the natives knew what kind of snake that was, and they knew what should have happened to him, but they said, how come nothing happened to him? And God had given that, him that supernatural gift as a sign, as, an, as evidence, okay? And they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Man, you see that all through the book of Acts. And then, uh, uh, so what they'll say is, see, this is what we're supposed to do. Just like we're supposed to go preach the gospel, we're supposed to do all these miracles. But actually, that's not what he said. He said, these are the signs that will follow those who believe. And he's talking to the disciples. They hadn't, this stuff hadn't happened yet. He's just telling them that it's going to happen after I depart. You go preach the gospel, and these signs are going to follow. And they did. What it doesn't say real clearly, and what I'm trying to show right now, is why they stopped at some point. And we don't have to do those things anymore, okay? And so if you will uh, look at uh, Timothy, 1 Timothy, and like I said, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 calls himself the last of the apostles and the least of the apostles. And, and uh, you don't see any evidence after that. He was the last one to see Jesus, the resurrected Jesus. And you don't see any evidence of that of anybody else carrying on that work of, of doing these grand miracles, okay? But, uh, but, but what we do see are men that he trained and he sent out, and he taught them uh, how to preach and, and all those kinds of things. And let's go real quickly, uh, what did I say, 1 Timothy? Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1. First Timothy chapter 1, and look at verse 1 through 7. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, uh, which is our hope unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, uh, which minister questions, ra rather uh, than godly edification, which is in faith. So do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart, and of a good conscience, and of, unfeigned, uh, and of faith unfeigned, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain janglings, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say, nor whereof they are firm. You keep reading through this, and you see that he's, all ta he's talking about people that don't have understanding. And he's saying, you need to have understanding, and you need to be able to convince them that they're wrong, and you need to be strong in the faith, and you need to be able to uh, 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 not make sure people don't teach other doctrines. Not saying anything about supernatural miracles to pass on, or you go, to, you go heal the sick, or, or, or uh, do anything like that. He's telling him all how to preach. And he's telling him how to continue on in the faith and the things he's been taught, right? It's not, he's not showing. You don't see anything in here. And then let's say that, let's say that he did, but, but he just has a, it just doesn't find its way in this, in this passage, in, in his words, right? Well, what about this? 
Timothy and Titus both give us a list of qualifications for bishops, past, uh, pastors, elders, okay? Gives us the qualifications. Do we see anywhere in the qualifications that in order to be a pastor, you must have done some kind of a sign miracle to confirm that you truly are called of God to preach the gospel, right? You don't see that. You don't see that anywhere. Let's look at, uh, uh, what is it, First uh, Timothy 3. First Timothy 3, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre. That's where a lot of the guys that are doing miracles are, are that's, I think, the real motivation, filthy lucre. But patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into the reproach of the, and the snare of the devil. Likewise, must de deacons be grave. And you go follow this list. You're not finding anybody that's told that by the fact that they're doing signs and miracles, is that going to be some kind of a sign or symbol that they actually have received the Holy Spirit, okay? Uh, again, we can go to Titus 1, 1 through 10, and, uh, and see the same thing. Let's just go ahead and read it. Let's go to verse 5. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and heal all the sick. And Oh, wait, no, no, it doesn't say that. <laughs> Ordain elders in every city, as I appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he had been taught, uh, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. He doesn't have to prove through miracles. He needs to convince them, right? And so this is why it's so important uh, that they, that, you know, that they understand uh, the, the truth of God and that they, they, they use sound wisdom. And actually, it's the opposite of what they say. Uh, I, I love the verse in Colossians uh, or in Ephesians 6. It says, be not drunk with wine where it is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Right. I think that's a, it's making a parallel. You got on one hand, someone's drunk with wine. On the other hand, you got somebody who's actually, if you look up Colossians, is saying you're exhorting one another, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. You're making sense. You're understanding what you're saying, right? All throughout the Bible, have a sound mind. Be sober. It's telling you just be in control of your thoughts. Be in control of what you do. Well, somebody that just starts blabbering, like speaking in tongues, just all of a sudden, they're not in control of themselves. They're not being of sound mind. They don't even know what they're doing. Right. Somebody uh, uh, that just these random things happen and like, oh, let's just get all crazy because we see the Holy Spirit moving. No, that's not how the Holy Spirit moves. The Holy Spirit leads us into truth and it gives us wisdom. And then we're able by that wisdom to take the final revelation of God, which P Peter says is more per uh, a more sure word Amen. of prophecy. And we're able to take that and we're able to show people and convince them. And you know what? The ones that are going to say, no, 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 I need to see a sign. They're not going to believe even if they did see a sign, right? They already have their minds made up. So the first thing was the, if, consider the purpose of the gift. Second thing is there's a lack of instruction to those who are passing on, uh, you know, like, like Paul, passing on uh, the final instructions of those who carry out the work of the ministry. Number three, this is, this is really s simple, so, you know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this. There's a lack of clear evidence that these things are happening. And I already covered that a little bit. Like there's a lack of evidence. Now people can say, oh no, we all saw it. We all saw that person, you know, was healed right before our eyes. But we live in a day and age with technology. I mean, look, there's two cameras going on right now. Somebody might be recording. I mean, we live in a day and age where if something supernatural really happens, I mean, let me, let me I don't, I hope I'm not bursting anyone's bubble. Bigfoot's not real, people. Do you know that? You know how we know Bigfoot's not real? Because there's no evidence of Bigfoot. <laughs> no substantial, I uh, hope I didn't make anybody mad by that. <laughs> there's no substantial evidence. 
with all the technology we have, people would see Bigfoot, all right? So then you got people saying, oh, there's UFOs. Well, you might be able to show me a couple pictures that something look, might possibly look like a UFO, but you mean to tell me they can catch pictures, they can get everything on camera, security cameras, everything's running all the time, they get everything on camera, and you can't really prove this, then, then you know, you don't really have a case. So all these guys that get up there with hundreds of thousands in the auditorium, and I, I picked on uh, uh, Benny Hinn this morning because he's one of the guys that I hate the most. I mean, he, he just uh, uh, makes me so mad and really kind of creeps me out when I watch him. But, uh, but he, he will take these people and deceive them. And you can just read right into it and see, like, he's studied people. He studied illusions. And he studied how to uh, maybe even hypnotize people. And, he, and it's so sickening. It makes me mad. But you've got hundreds of thousands of people out there. And, you know, people will come out of that and thousands of those people, at least thousands, will say... Man, we watched him heal people today. But, you know, we live in an age where people say, I want proof. And so a lot of people have followed up after them. There's documentaries out there. You can see it for yourself. They've went and interviewed those people that say, oh, yeah, there was a miracle. There was a miracle. And at the end of the day, they find out maybe some of those people really believe they were healed. But give them a day or two and their back's hurting again. In fact, it's hurting worse because, uh, because they thought for a second that their back was healed and they started jumping around. <laughs> And now it's like broken or something like that, right? And so they follow up on these guys and they find out they weren't healed. They believed what they wanted to believe. The man tricked them so that they can get more money out of them because he asked like for thousands of dollars from those people out there. And he says like the bigger you give, the bigger the miracle. And so he's, that's why he's able to, you know, uh, live the way he does, I guess. Which is actually probably evidence that he's not saved because I don't think God would let a saved person get away with that right. and be successful. You know what I mean? Yeah. Anyway, we already know he's not saved, but I'm just saying. Okay, so, so the lack of evidence with technology today, uh, there, there is no evidence. Now, at the same time, you're saying, well, you're talking about evidence, but what about this faith? You said faith. Yeah, I think faith is stronger than evidence. In fact, faith is the evidence of things unseen. Uh, uh, the yeah, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> that is faith. But my faith is in the Bible, right, that those things happen. I don't have to wait for it. If I had to wait for a sign to confirm that the Bible is true, that that's not faith in the Bible. That's faith in some sign that's going to that's gonna happen. And so, uh, so it's kind of ridiculous that they would continue to, uh, to trust and wait for that. And then the last thing is this, and I think this is a really important one. The last reason uh, we can understand the validity of cessationism is because the prophecies in the Bible regarding false prophets, the prophecies regarding false prophets. Uh, the Bible said, uh, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 11, and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. We can expect there's going to be false prophets. We can expect there are going to be people who are deceptive trying to deceive us, doing whatever they can to get us to believe, you know, what they want us to believe. Okay, and one of the ways we, one of the things we see in the Bible is that all these false prophets are only like uh, uh, kind of uh, pictures of the final false prophet, which is the Antichrist. Right. And when the Antichrist comes on the scene, guess what he's doing? Revelation chapter 13. Revelation 13, verse 14. All right, we got to back up more than that. Let's see here. Uh, verse 13, And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh the fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which hath, uh, had the wound by a sword and did live. Okay, and so you see all these things, somebody coming back to life. He had power to give life unto the image of the beast. Uh, that image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Uh, so you're seeing all this, decept this deception and uh, it leads to people accepting the mark of the beast and following the Antichrist and all this stuff because he's deceived them through signs and miracles. Look at chapter 16. Actually, 
actually, I don't think that's it. I'm not sure what I was going at. Look at 19. Revelation chapter 19. Nineteen and verse twenty. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. So you see this prophecy Jesus made that there shall be, there will be false prophets. So we can expect that. And then we see that in the very end, there's going to be a false prophet who is, is convincing the whole world through miracles and signs and all this to believe in him and trust in him. So I'm thinking as a Christian, reading these final words in the Bible, in Revelation, and knowing what we know and all the things that we just covered, wouldn't you be more likely to believe that somebody, if they, whether, whether it's real miracles or fake miracles or demonic uh, influence miracles, that that's more likely to show you that they're a false prophet, right? By the fact that they're doing these miracles, they're probably, they might possibly be trying to trick you. <laughs> and, they're, and they're saying in many cases that those are like uh, uh, their proof that even if they say something that contradicts the Bible, they're like, well, yeah, but what about these signs and these miracles? What about these prophecies that were made? And you're supposed to trust that. Well, I'm thinking, no, I'm supposed to trust the Bible. And probably, if anything, that's evidence that these people are actually trying to deceive you for some reason. They're trying right. to probably love of money, which is the root of all evil, probably trying to get money from you. So they're trying to deceive you. They're trying to trick you. And so look at, let's conclude in Matthew again, as we already read at the beginning of the sermon. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And we'll read that text again, verse, starting in verse 15. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Right? They've got a form of godliness. Right? They might look like they're godly, look like they're Christians, but it really they're ravenous wolves, man. They're false prophets. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Well, that's funny because we talk to a lot of people who are charismatic, and you ask them, well, what does a person have to do to be saved? Uh, follow the Ten Commandments? <laughs> Where did you learn that from? How long have you been going to this charismatic church? 20 years? 6 years? 10 years? We heard people that have been there for a long time. No clue how to be saved. That's not fruit. <laughs> That's not fruit. And so uh, by their fruit, uh, you should know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the lake of fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. I find it interesting this next verse. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven... Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? Doesn't that sound like somebody who was influenced by the charismatic teaching and they're thinking, wait, no, I know that I was casting out demons. I know that I was doing many great works in the name of Jesus. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I find it so strange that people actually act like, well, you can't just accept the Bible and accept Jesus Christ and be saved because many in the last day will say, Lord, Lord, and he'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. And what they're saying is you can't just have faith. You've got to be able to do all these works too. And I'm like, did you even read that text? Uh, yeah. Because the text actually says people are trusting in those works in those signs, in those experiences, in those feelings, and all those kinds of things. And they're saying, no, I'm saved. And he's saying, I never knew you. 
right? right? Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Work iniquity, what do you mean? I repented of all my sins and I turned over a new leaf and I, and I accepted Jesus as my, my Lord. <laughs> and they use all those words, but there was never any faith in there that trusted in the work that Jesus Christ did alone and said, I'm just believing it by faith. I don't need signs. I don't need miracles. I don't need any of that stuff. And uh, what a sad day that people will die and go to hell thinking that they've been doing good things for the Lord. I don't think every person that's influenced by the charismatic movement is wicked. I think they've been deceived. Yep. And we need to love them. We need to give them the truth and, uh, and, and expose the, the falsehood and the false prophets. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and the security that we can have in the word. And because we have secured it, security in your word, Lord, we have a blessed assurance that, uh, that we are saved uh, we do have eternal life. No one can pluck us out of your hands, Lord. And it does, we don't need signs and miracles to prove that. We believe the signs and miracles that are in the Bible. And we trust it by faith, Lord. I pray you help us get that message out to this world and all throughout Kansas City and Iola and anywhere we have a reach. Uh, Lord, help us to do that. I pray for the, uh, this possible uh, film in the future that you'd bless it if it be your will, and you would give us the ability to uh, produce that so others will see it and souls will be saved by the, uh, by the efforts. Uh, Lord, we give you praise for all that you've done. Uh, we love you and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>